let me let me welcome everyone to this week's okay. seminar research webinar where we, we have the pleasure of receiving Lawrence Cristiano, who is the Alfred W. Chase Professor of Business Institutions at Northwestern University. Uh, he is also a consultant to the Federal Reserve Banks of Atlanta, Chicago, and Minneapolis. And he's a research affiliate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And in 2001, he was elected a fellow of the Econometric Society. As uh, most of you know, Professor Cristiano's research has been focused primarily on the problem of determining how the government monetary and fiscal instruments ought to respond to shocks over the business cycle. This research has two parts. One involves formulating and estimating an empirical plausible model of the macroeconomy, of which uh, we have many contributions since uh, the early 90s. Mm. And the second involves developing economic concept, concepts and computational methods for determining optimal policy in an equilibrium model. He has received uh, numerous grants from the National Science Foundation. I counted six. And he's an associate editor of the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. Professor Cristiano teaches macroeconomics, international finance, and applied time series analysis at Northwestern University. Uh, he also has a regular uh, course that he teaches for central bankers together with uh, some of his colleagues there at Northwestern University, I think every year. Professor Cristiano received his PhD in economics from Columbia University, and prior to his appointment at Northwestern, he worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and was a professor at the University of Chicago. Today, Professor Cristiano is going to talk to us about uh, his current work on labor markets in business cycles, that is joint work with Martin Eichenbaum and Matthias Chaban, and that is work that he's preparing for the Handbook of Macroeconomics Volume 2 that is forthcoming. Thank you very much, Larry. Please go ahead. OK. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Um, I haven't done a webinar before, so I, uh, I, hope, I hope everything works out OK. Um, hello to everyone. I guess I can't see everybody, so it um, feels like I'm talking to myself. Uh, but feel free to interrupt, I guess, with a chat or, or, or whatever. Um, so as, as Alberto said, this is, um, this is work related to what we're preparing in a, in a handbook chapter on labor markets and business cycles. It summarizes both what, I, what we have in the handbook chapter as well as uh, two other papers um, uh, that, that we have. I'm going to focus, uh, this presentation will be a little bit more focused than the whole handbook chapter. Uh, I think it would be too much to swallow the whole thing in, in, uh, in, in one talk. Um, so let me begin with the, with the background. Um, let me make sure I get everything set up properly here. So I'll begin with a, the with a motivation for this, um, for our work. Um, so uh, maybe it's surprising, but uh, macroeconomic models uh, that are designed to account for the business cycle don't do very well on employment fluctuations. And especially if you think that employment fluctuations are the essence of business cycle, um, uh, it's, it's pretty weird that we're, we haven't gotten very far uh, on, this, on this issue. In particular, when we write down a macro model, it turns out that the volatility of the labor market in the model is, is it's quite low by comparison with, um, with what it is in the data. And this is an issue that uh, macroeconomists have been struggling with forever, uh, including going all the way back to Lucas and Rapping's 1969 paper. That may be the first uh, equilibrium model of, uh, of a macro economy. There is a, there's a pretty kind of standard understanding of what the problem is. So the problem is that in a macro model, uh, what you have is that the model predicts that wages rise really sharply when there's a shock that launches a boom, and uh, that that rise in wages discourages firms from uh, expanding employment. 
the idea is that um, uh, so that th this is the basic reason why employment doesn't fluctuate very much uh, in those models. Excuse me, I'm going to be interrupted by I see my Outlook, which I want to get out of here. There we go. So we won't get any interruptions from that. Um, so this, the standard view is that wages are simply way too procyclical and that uh, the models then imply too little expansion in employment. In the data, we don't see a lot of, pro we see procyclicality in the wage, but it's not hugely procyclical. And of course, we see a lot of procyclicality in, uh, in employment. Now, as I said, this is a pervasive problem in macroeconomics. Uh, so in particular, if we look at sort of the classic RBC model, this was an obsession of the RBC literature. Um, uh, that, that model could account for the fluctuations in GDP pretty well, uh, but it simultaneously predicted that employment was quite smooth, and uh, this was a this was a subject of great interest to people in that in that area. Um, similarly, you, the st uh, standard efficiency wage models also have difficulty uh, getting the right fluctuations in employment, and fundamentally, again, because wages are way too procyclical in the efficiency wage model. Michelle Alexopoulos uh, has, has written about that. And then finally, there's the kind of the most famous uh, statement of this problem uh, was made by Scheimer in recent years. And, uh, and he explained how it is that in the standard uh, DMP, Diamond Morton's and Pissarini model, Pissarini's model, uh, you get um, too little fluctuations in employment and uh, unemployment. And he relates that to the excessive procyclicality of the, of the real wage. So, oh, so um, the the I think you, the upshot of all of this uh, these observations is that if we're going to build a successful model, a macroeconomic model, we're going to have to have something. Uh, I guess I'm going to call real wage inertia. Uh, that is to say, we're going to have to have that the model has the property that there's a small response of the real wage to shocks and um, that when that response uh, occurs, uh, it's kind of very smooth and flat. And that's going to be the theme uh, of, of the presentation that I want to do, do now. Now, in recent years, the New Keynesian model has been uh, played a big role in uh, macroeconomic analysis. And the New Keynesian model, turns out, has no problem uh, uh, getting the fluctuations in employment uh, that we observe. Um, However, and there's a big but here, uh, first of all, these models basically assume the result. Uh, the models uh, get wages, wage inertia uh, by simply assuming that wages are sticky. And uh, so in that sense, they're maybe not, not satisfactory in a kind of a, uh, I don't know, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic sense. Uh, in particular, there isn't any economic rationale for the inertia of the real wage. Uh, in those in those models, um, the other uh, related issue is that in those sticky wage models, uh, we can't use them to analyze sort of uh, standard mo uh, well policy issues. Uh, in particular, we can't use the models to think about what would happen if we extend unemployment benefits. Now, this is a huge problem because, at least in the, in the United States, in recent years. Uh, what we should do with unemployment benefits was a big topic of, of uh, discussion. And um, the, I view these, the essence of these DSGE models as being their job is to contribute to policy discussions about policy. And uh, when it came to unemployment benefits, they simply uh, could not make any contribution uh, because those models were based on sticky wages. And uh, those models, uh, those sticky wage models are really hard it's really hard to get them uh, to address unemployment. You can do that, but standard versions of these models imply pervasive union, union power, and they also require uh, kind of playing around with preferences in order to get them to work uh, properly. So I'm going to sort of summarize uh, various thinking about this by saying that those sticky wage models can't be used very easily to think about unemployment uh, benefits and the consequences of it. What we're going to do is we're going to stress uh, the class of models. I guess that Scheimer said don't work very doesn't work very well. Uh, what we're going to argue is that the search and matching model, the style of DM, 
the model called DMP model, uh, can actually do very well uh, accounting for key uh, macro data and also, uh, crucially, uh, accounting for the labor market. And the beauty of those models is that, of course, uh, they are very much about unemployment. Uh, it's very natural to think about what happens when you extend unemployment benefits. Uh, in those models, you can think about all those kind of policy questions that you can't find in the um, sticky wage uh, kind of world. We're going to look at two versions of the search and matching model, differentiated according to uh, what kind, how how bargaining is done. Um, the one that we're going to end up concluding is the best one is the so-called alternating offer bargaining uh, model, which was suggested by Hall and Milgram in a famous paper in, uh, in 2008. Uh, we, in effect, we take their uh, argument, which was done in a more of a theoretical type of model, a classic theory labor market model, and we're extending it to monetary uh, DSG type of an environment. I'm also going to contrast. I'm going to contrast uh, what we get with the so-called Nash bargaining approach to um, to bargaining, and um, and I'll be able to make some remarks about, for example, the Scheimer puzzle because Scheimer argues when Scheimer says that the DMP model can't address the volatility of of labor market variable, he's really talking about the Nash bargaining model and the alternative offer bargaining uh, uh, model uh, actually doesn't have is not as vulnerable to his critique, as we'll see. Um, the crucial thing I want to emphasize here is that in the models that we're going to consider, consider especially the alternating offer bargaining model, the, the, those models will be characterized by wage inertia, and, but it gets wage inertia as an equilibrium outcome. There will not be, we're not going to make any assumptions, exogenous restrictions on how wages are set uh, in order to get the wage inertia to be uh, a property of the model. Again, I want to repeat um, a theme that shot through this whole work is that wage inertia is essential if you're going to uh, be have a model that explains the volatility of labor markets. Um, and by the way, uh, wages wage inertia is also a characteristic of actual of actual wage data. Um, we estimate, uh, we're going to estimate a variety of models uh, in addition to these, uh, these two. Um, for example, in our paper, we, we include a model. It's a DSG model in which we allow the wages to be set completely arbitrarily. And that allows us to document the sense in which uh, the, the model wants uh, wage inertia because it's completely arbitrary representation of wages and we estimate it, it's going to come out with a, an estimated wage process that's very, very um, inertial uh, and that will help us document uh, this, this theme that we're pushing. I'm actually not going to talk about this model in the interest of minimizing the number of models I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, I'm going to end up really focusing my attention on this alternating offer bargaining model just to streamline uh, the discussion. In any case, this flexible thing allows us to make precise this idea of wage inertia being uh, crucial if you want to have a good uh, macro model. Okay, let me summarize the, the basic findings. Um, the findings are actually you can get lots of models to match the aggregate time series data and they match about as well. Uh, I'll be showing that for alternating offer bargaining and for um, uh, Nash bargaining. Uh, we show that for a larger set of models too in the papers. Um, the, the second finding, uh, I've already said this a few times, is that uh, all the successful models exhibit weight, real wage inertia. Uh, so this raises a problem and this is going to be uh, increasingly a problem I think as we go forward in, in macroeconomics that the macro data don't allow us to distinguish between uh, models. And so we're going to emphasize, I'm going to emphasize in this presentation, two ways uh, to distinguish uh, between models when you can't tell the difference based on macro data. One is going to be the micro evidence. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one key parameter, the so-called replacement ratio. Um, the replacement ratio is, the, is how much un <clears throat> is the quantity of money you get for unemployment benefits as a as a ratio of the of the wage rate, 
and <clears throat> we have evidence on this in the micro in the micro data and, and this will the estimated replacement ratio from the micro data um, will play a role in in choosing between models that have been estimated on the aggregate data. Uh, the second thing I've already referred to, I'm not going to talk about this anymore, which is the observed union density. Also, uh, in the micro data, the union density that we observe in the data uh, allows us, gives us some information that allows us to um, differentiate between different macro models that uh, address unemployment. Uh, in particular, uh, the union density data are what make me um, uh, pessimistic that sticky wage models will be useful as models uh, of unemployment. But I'm not going to expand on this during this presentation. Uh, I have a macro annual discussion of a paper by Gali, Smets, and Wouters on this uh, subject where I go into great detail about this union density uh, issue. So the, the first way you can dif differentiate between different models that look the same from the point of view of the macro data is by bringing ma micro evidence uh, to bear. Uh, but there's a second way that you can uh, distinguish between models, which is according to the questions that they can address. And uh, so the DMP model is going to look attractive uh, to us because they can address uh, questions about the labor market. The labor market has been increasingly a puzzle in recent years. Um, uh, uh, this is the subject of one of the papers that's a background paper for this presentation. It's a paper called uh, Understanding the Great Recession by me and, well, the same co-authors, Marty Eichenbaum and, and uh, Matthias Trevant. Um, and there's some puzzling things that we see in, uh, uh, in the labor market, in particular a big fall in labor force participation as the economy seem, is trying to get out of the recession, which is an unusual uh, thing. So we can think about labor force participation, vacancy posting, uh, hiring rates, all kinds of stuff using the DMP model. Uh, and uh, we can think about the consequences for those things of various types of policy uh, measures, not just unemployment uh, compensation. Um, we're going to argue, uh, so then what I'm going to do in the last part of my presentation is I'm going to take the preferred model, the alternating offer bargaining model, which we're going to select based on micro evidence and class of questions. I'm going to take this preferred model and I'm going to look at the question about what is the effect of increasing unemployment benefits uh, in the United States. Um, and uh, I'm going to argue that uh, based, I'm going to show, or I'm going to argue that monetary policy and nominal rigidities are very, very important to take into account carefully when you think about the effects of unemployment benefits uh, because they make a huge difference. So this will be a little theme at the very end that um, if you want to think about the labor markets, uh, maybe it's ironic or maybe it's weird or unexpected, but if you want to think about labor markets, you really have to think about what are the nominal rigidities in the economy uh, and, uh, and it makes a big difference. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you that at the very end before I, before I conclude. Um, yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to end up arguing that the increase in unemployment benefits uh, that occurred in recent years in the United States uh, probably did not have a very big effect on unemployment. Uh, this is in contrast with uh, other studies in the more traditional uh, labor literature, which ignore uh, financial, uh, uh, which which ignore nominal rigidities. Uh, uh, in the standard labor market literature, the effect of unemployment benefits uh, is viewed as having had a very big effect in the, in, uh, the recent years. Uh, now I'm looking at a chat. Um, so um, does everyone see what, this, the, what the, the, the message that Alberto just uh, included? Yes, okay. So could goods markets be modeled with some of these search features that you are using for the labor market? And what will be the advantages and disadvantages of doing so? So my guess is that good markets, goods markets actually could be modeled. I mean, it would be a great idea to model goods markets in this way because uh, in particular, when you think of the chain of production from, say, uh, commodities and other primitive inputs all the way up to the, the taking the chain all the way up to final goods, at each link in the chain, what you have is um, you have a supplier and a demander, each of which has kind of idiosyncratic uh, needs. 
you know, if your Nike shoes, you want the soles to be of a certain size and width and whatever. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in those relationships. Uh, so in those relationships, it's probably the case that it's hard to find kind of the right guy, the one who's going to uh, satisfy your idiosyncratic uh, uh, interests. And once you found that person, you're not going to let go of them uh, very easily. So I, I think that actually this whole search and matching thing uh, is actually much, much more important than just uh, in the labor market and, um, and can be used to, um, uh, to think about uh, production more generally. Actually, once you start thinking about this, you also start thinking, I believe, about mechanisms which can promote co-movement across economies. So one of the puzzles in international macro is how do we explain the uh, co-movement across economies without assuming that all the shocks are kind of the same or highly correlated. Uh, one way to do that is to think of mechanisms whereby uh, prices in different economies don't absorb uh, changes in demand for stuff and um, when you take this search and matching approach that I'm going to describe here with, al with alternating offer bargaining, uh, you will end up putting in some uh, rigidity in the prices bet between suppliers and demanders somewhere in the middle of the production chains. And I think that will help promote uh, co-movement and help uh, provide a resolution or an answer to this, uh, to this puzzle. So that's my, my answer to Alberto's comment. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So let's so let's get started now. What um, the model is? I sort of now summarize what I what I want to say, and uh, so now let's get into more of the details of the model. Um, the um, the model is in many ways a very conventional model that that all of you will be pretty familiar with a conventional kind of DSGE model. Um, so my big stress is going to be on the part that's that's uh, not so conventional. I guess I'll call it the labor market uh, part. And then I'll just show you very quickly um, what the other parts are all about. Those are parts that you, you guys are already familiar with, but then it'll, you'll see how this, uh, this whole thing, I think, fit, fits together. So in talking about the, the labor market, the model, this, let's just sort of uh, narrow, narrow the focus a little bit and think about workers and firms. And uh, uh, in this labor, inside the labor market, there's going to be competition uh, everywhere. All the actors in this model, uh, in this part of the model, are uh, are atomistic. Um, so we have a lot of firms, and uh, and and they all produce uh, something homogeneous. You could call it shmu, uh, and they produce shmu using uh, labor. And the production function is very simple: one unit of labor produces one unit of shmu. There's no technology shocks uh, or anything like that in this uh, in this uh, setup. Um, I guess I'll mention I'll probably mention this as we go forward a little bit. And I'm I'm using a very simple model, and and um, I mean it's not too simple, uh, but it's sort of simple. It's it's I, I believe that if we make it more complicated in, in interesting directions, and I, I think I'll I'll mention some of these as we go forward. We make it more interesting. Uh, the the basic point that I'm gonna, that I'm making here will will survive, uh, but it will be more complicated and it will be less appropriate for a kind of presentation I'm doing here, which is I'm trying to I'm trying to focus on a particular idea, a particular mechanism for a, a getting wage inertia, real wage inertia. Anyway, so the the you got these firms and these workers, and uh, the firm that that wants to run into a worker. Uh, this is going to be very conventional. I'm following, we're following Pizzarides here and, and Najipal and Mortensen. Firm that wants to meet a worker in period T has to post uh, a vacancy cost, ST, uh, and ST is the real vacancy cost in the sense that it's in, in units of the consumption uh, good. And then once it's posted a vacancy cost, uh, there's some probability that that vacancy will be uh, filled uh, in the sense that a worker uh, a suitable worker will show up. Let's see this little guy here. Uh, I got a little white thing there. Okay. Um, okay, there we go. Well, there's something weird going on. Okay. I, part of this has been whited out, but hopefully you can see. 
the, the first formula here shows you the probability Q is the probability a vacancy is filled. And uh, in the standard way, uh, we imagine that that probability is determined by this thing called upper gamma, where uh, gamma is the uh, labor market tightness. It's negatively related. As the labor market's tighter, then uh, you fill vacancies uh, with lower probability. And the, this uh, labor market tightness is, is uh, oh, shoot. Yeah, when I go through the text, it goes whites out. OK, so when the labor market, uh, the numerator in that gamma is uh, VT times LT minus 1. VT is the vacancy rate expressed in the quantity of people working in the previous period. So the numerator is the total number of vacancies. And then the denominator has the total number of people searching uh, uh, at the end of period T minus 1 uh, for a job. So that's what we call uh, day T labor market uh, tightness. Um, now, uh, so, so, this, so the firm pays ST, posts a vacancy, and then maybe, maybe somebody shows up. They show up with probability Q. Before the firm can actually start bargaining with the worker, uh, the firm has to also pay a fixed cost uh, kappa before they, can start, uh, be before they can start bargaining. This, is a, um, this kappa here is very important, actually. I probably will not spend much time talking about it because in the interest of focus, I'm going to be focusing on the, on the bargaining. But this kappa is, uh, is also very important for generating, uh, for allowing us to get a lot of volatility in the labor market. Uh, Naji Paul and Mor Mortensen were the people who, who were a couple of people who really, really uh, emphasized this. And I have a paper on a, a small open economy of Sweden, uh, which also uh, goes into this um, uh, in, 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 in big detail. Um, if, if people raise questions about this, then uh, we can discuss it. But otherwise, I'll probably, I might even forget to mention much more about it. So the point here is that to get a firm, to get a worker to, to actually talk with, the firm has to post a vacancy. Then if a suitable worker shows up, and that happens with probability Q, then the firm has to pay another cost uh, before they can start uh, bargaining. And this cost kappa is um, not uh, sensitive to the uh, business cycle. Actually, I, I now wish I didn't have a subscript T on there. And that cost S uh, is also, uh, I wish I didn't have a subscript T on that as well. It's, those are constant, not cyclical. OK, so the labor market, the next step is that uh, workers and firm, once they get together and all the costs have been made, paid, then the worker and the firm, they start, you know, they start bargaining. And the bargaining I'm going to talk about is alternated offer, alternating offer bargaining. As soon as they reach agreement, the production uh, starts right away. And then um, uh, these two people remain matched uh, in the next period with probability rho. Um, this rho here is a parameter. Um, and there, there's a kind of a simplification that's been adopted. Again, I don't think it changes the point that's being made here. Uh, but but rho uh, is kind of empirically plausible to have the separation rate to not, not be very uh, cyclical. But it hides some very cyclical things behind it. Because rho is a combination of the layoff rate and the um, quit rate. Those two things are very cyclically sensitive. Uh, so those two different reasons for separating are very cyclically sensitive. But the amount of separation or the rate of separation itself is not cyclically sensitive. We know how to, to model the quit rate and how to model the uh, layoff rate. Uh, but uh, that's a complication that, um, that is not of interest uh, here, I believe. OK, so let's now talk. Let's get, let's get moving to in the direction of talking about this bargaining. So, um, the, uh, so to talk about that, I have to talk about the value fun you know, how everybody thinks about whatever. So the value function uh, for a firm uh, the, uh, who's working uh, with somebody at wage W, we will discuss in a moment how W is determined. Let's, but let's imagine that W is, uh, has been determined the real wage. The firm hires the worker, pays W, and then the worker pay, makes one unit of shmu, which is what I said a minute ago. But this var theta thing here, I'm using scientific workplace this looks like a theta. It is a theta to normal people, but scientific workplace calls that bar theta, and I'll call that bar theta. So 
this uh, this Vartheta is the real price of the shmu that the worker uh, makes. Uh, in the labor market literature, this Vartheta would be a, a, a technology shock. Uh, here we have this Vartheta that it's stochastic, but it's actually endogenous because it's a real price that I'll discuss uh, later. And then uh, with some probability rho, they remain matched. And then tomorrow is the value of this uh, match, uh, J. And M is the stochastic discount factor here. Uh, of course, bar theta and M, they're all, uh, those are equilibrium objects that are, that are determined in the model endogenously. One way to sort of see how this model works is that uh, there's a free entry condition uh, by, of the firms, which guarantees that, uh, that zero profits it says that when the firm posts a vacancy, then uh, here's the cost. The benefit is um, uh, that with probability Q, they'll meet a worker, and uh, they will get what they'll squeeze out of that worker is JT minus kappa, because they have to pay the kappa when they, when they meet, the, meet the worker. So this is the, this is the condition. Uh, I guess the classical condition has cap, kappa equal to 0, so that S is just equal to Q times J. Um, that uh, condition has been kind of criticized because um, the, uh, Q is a function of market tightness. So you can see in order to get market, market tightness to move around, you have to get J to move around a lot. And people think that that J, uh, that this model is not very good explaining why J moves around. When you introduce kappa, then the picture changes a lot. So for example, suppose that S was zero, so there was no vacancy cost. Then the market free entry condition says that JT has to equal kappa, and kappa is this constant. And so um, uh, what it would say in that case is that uh, the J is also constant in equilibrium. So it, it deals with this problem that people have uh, discussed about how this kind of the standard model of search and matching, which has kappa equal to zero, predicts excessive movements in J. Uh, if we went to the other extreme where, where S is zero and kappa is not zero, we would eliminate entirely the movements in J. Okay, now the value function of a worker. So the worker gets a wage W, uh, and uh, so that's the current flow benefit of working. And then you can see the future stuff, you can see, in a way, you can see what the model is all about in the future uh, stuff. You can see right away this is a two-state model of the labor market. Uh, you can either be employed or, un or unemployed, and um, that's actually a drawback. And we we stress that in one of the other papers that are behind this, the great understanding the Great Recession, because in the Great Recession you had a big drop in labor force uh, in in non-employment in the labor force participation rate, and uh, this uh, big drop looks like it was to some extent anyway endogenously uh, endogenous to the business cycle and so one would want to have that in a model uh, like this and we showed how to how to do that in the other in the other paper in this paper we have just a two state uh, thing and we take the not in the labor force or the the people who are not participate not in the labor force participation rate we take that as uh, zero people and um, again i don't think that distract from my essential point so tomorrow, with probability rho, you stick with the same firm, and you get this, you get this value function. And with probability 1 minus rho, you separate from the firm. And if you separate from the firm, then with probability ft plus 1, which is the job finding rate, you'll find another firm and work for them. Or you won't find another firm, in which case you'll become unemployed, and your, your value will be uh, capital UT in period t plus 1. All this is discounted using the standard uh, discount rate here. Okay, then uh, the law of motion for employment, the total number of people working yesterday is this. Row of them will be working again today. And then the endogenous variable here, xt, is the hiring rate. xt times lt minus 1 will be newly. Uh, xt times lt minus 1 is the part of lt uh, that is uh, that new, newly employed. And the job finding rate is the ratio of the total number of people who find uh, new jobs today, xt times lt minus 1, divided by there in the denominator is the total number of people uh, who are looking for jobs. I, maybe I show you here again, just to, so you can have a feel for the model, the number of people looking for a job, the people in this denominator uh, is uh, 1 minus rho lt minus 1. 
uh, it, it's this thing here, and how does it come to be? Well, the number of people who were unemployed in the previous period is 1 minus LT minus 1. Those are the number of people not employed. And then the number of people who separated in the previous period is 1 minus rho times LT minus 1. If you add up the number of unemployed and the just now separated, you get 1 minus rho LT minus 1. You get the total number of people searching for a job. That's the term in the denominator. This is not the number of people unemployed. It's, there are more people searching for a job simply than the ones who are unemployed. And that's, uh, that's also true in the actual data. Okay, finally, I've got the what is the value of unemployment to a worker? Well, the unemployed worker gets a current flow uh, payment of D, that's the uh, unemployment compensation that they get, and then tomorrow they'll either find a job, in which case they'll get VT plus 1, or they won't find a job, in which case uh, they get UT plus 1. And D is the unemployment benefits. The D to the ratio of D to W is the famous, uh, is the replacement ratio, uh, which I'll refer to a little bit more later. Okay, so now let's talk about bargaining. So I've talked about how it is that fir firms and workers get together. I've talked about how they feel about things as a function of the wage rate. Now let's talk about how the wage rate is actually determined. So uh, it's determined by bargaining. And the, what we assume is that when these people bargain, they're bargaining over the current, of the real wage that's going to be paid in the current, in the current period. The period of the model is the quarter. So you, the, the bargaining session, uh, a full bargaining session, occurs on a t t uh, quarterly uh, basis. I'll have more to say about this in, in a minute, but just in the model here, the baseline model, bargaining occurs in, in a quarter, and of course there's a chance that these two people will still be connected in the next period, it's probability rho, and they'll be bargaining then too. And uh, so the equilibrium we have here is a kind of a Markov kind of an equilibrium, because the idea is the following. They take the bargaining that's going to happen tomorrow as given, particular the wage is going to be negotiated and when they take it as given they're thinking about the they know about the equilibrium mapping from the state tomorrow to the wage tomorrow so they take that mapping to tomorrow as given and then they negotiate today for a wage rate in the process of negotiating they create a new mapping today between the state of the economy and the wage so you have a mapping from the uh, you you have a, a uh, an operator <laughs> Uh, from the mapping tomorrow, the bargaining mapping tomorrow, to the bargaining mapping today, and we focus on a fixed point, the equilibrium of our model is the fixed point in the space uh, of this map mapping. In some sense, we use the standard Markov equilibrium uh, concept. Um, okay, so the way the bargaining works is the two people sit down, they're sitting down in a chair, one is looking at the other one, and the firm opens up with an offer. It says, you know, I'll pay you, I'll offer you uh, 10 bucks. And then um, the, the worker has the option to say, um, I don't want those 10 bucks. Uh, and they can, they can reject the offer. And then they can say, you know, I hate you so much. Uh, not only do I not want the 10 bucks from you, uh, but I don't want to talk to you anymore. So the worker could reject the offer and, and, uh, and uh, just leave and the negotiations break down, in which case the worker would have to go into unemployment. Uh, the alternative is that the worker can reject the offer and make a, uh, a counter offer. Uh, or the firm, the worker could uh, accept the offer, in which case they would start uh, bargaining immediately. All right, so then, now, now, if suppose that the worker has rejected the offer and now makes a counter offer, then the firm may reject the worker's counter offer and then at a cost uh, gamma, uh, the, the firm could counter that. I mean, I guess we know that bargaining is expensive, especially when it gets protracted uh, and you got to figure out how to counter and so on. We capture that uh, response in the bargaining when it's uh, protracted by this uh, thing, uh, this thing gamma. Uh, one thing is that whenever anybody rejects, uh, it risks uh, triggering a breakdown in a complete breakdown in the negotiations with probability delta, in the case of a breakdown in negotiations, uh, everybody goes to their outside option, the worker goes to unemployment, and the firm, uh, well, the firm actually goes to zero. They just get nothing. Uh, that's, uh, that's it. Let me just say something about the timing of this bargaining. So the way we do this is, as I said, the model is quarterly. 
uh, we, we specify it to be quarterly because a lot of our data are quarterly and we wanted to avoid the time temporal aggregation uh, issues. Um, actually, in the handbook chapter, we will also consider daily models and address the temporal aggregation issues. But what we have so far is our, our data is quarterly, so we have the model being quarterly. But now we can't have the offers and counter offers being made on a quarterly basis because that's ridiculous. So the way we do this is we chop the quarter up into days. And the way the bargaining works is that the firm makes the opening offer on the first day, and then the, the worker gets a chance to reject and make a counteroffer on the second day, and then the firm gets to make a, reject the worker's offer and make a counter on the third day, and so on, and we give 60 days. There are approximately 60 work days during a quarter, and so we, uh, we assume that the bar we give the bargaining uh, 60 days to happen. On the last day, uh, the worker makes a take it or leave it offer. So this is the framework. This is the alternating offer uh, uh, framework, the way we do it. And what happens is, because each side knows everything about the other side, what happens is that the firm, when they make an offer, it's accepted immediately. Um, the firm has to think a lot about how to make that offer because the firm has to think, you know, the firm wants to offer the lowest possible wage it can get by with, which means it has to know uh, what the what the what the worker's kind of red line is. How low will the worker uh, go and not reject the, the the offer? And in order to know what the worker's red line is, the firm has to know what the worker thinks the firm's red line would be in the event that the worker. Uh, rejects and thinks about a counteroffer. You you have to think about the negotiations all the way to the end point. The firm has to think about all this stuff in order to make that uh, uh, initial opening offer. And once it's made that offer, it's accepted immediately because it's all done. Uh, it's all done correctly. Of course, in reality, we know that bargaining doesn't uh, always just begin and stop with the first offer. And I think, well, through the eyes of this model, the reason for that is that, in reality, uh, opponents in the bargaining situation don't know exactly what's the situation of the other side. They don't know exactly what the renegotiation costs are. Or they, don't, they don't know exactly what the outside options are, and so on. So in practice, you get mistakes. The, the wrong offers are made, and, and, and you actually do get rejections. But in this model, we don't, in equilibrium, get rejections. We get in equilibrium, the first wage is they make, the worker makes an offer and it's accepted immediately. Uh, what that wage is is driven entirely by what would happen out of equilibrium if the firm offered a really low wage. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but in equilibrium, they just make, it, uh, they make an offer and that's it. The, the, this feature of alternating offer bargaining means that it's, it's not obvious when you look at a particular work setting whether they're doing alternating offer bargaining or maybe even something that's radically different, which is take it or leave it offer, uh, making take it or leave it offers. Because the firm just puts up a wage and then uh, the workers accept it. So it looks like a take it or leave it wage. But actually what we assume is that the worker feels that they can, uh, they could bargain uh, a little bit and just choose not to. Uh, a lot of this work is just crying out for surveys of micro data to find out actually how bargaining uh, is done. For example, we'd love to see a question in a survey that would say, when you took your job, did you feel like you could have, no, sorry, when you take your job, did you have the opportunity to bargain? Did you bargain? Or, or when you took your job and if you didn't bargain, did you feel like you had the opportunity to bargain? Questions like that would be very useful in micro surveys and shed a lot of light. Okay. So what's the basic idea here? Remember, we're trying to get a, we're trying to get at real wage uh, rigidity, and so uh, how does alternating offer bargaining do that? Uh, well, here's the basic idea: um, alternating offer. You can think about alternating offer. The bargaining thing is as a as some kind of a process which produces as an output the wage, and if there are things inside that process which are not too sensitively linked to the state of the economy, then the outcome also will not be too sensitively linked to the state of the economy. And of course, that's the holy grail, getting the wage to be a little bit less linked uh, to the state of the economy. 
And one of the things that's in the alternating offer bargaining is this gamma thing, which is not a function of the state of the economy, and that helps to make the wage less, uh, less cyclical. You can see that from this gamma. Now, we don't want uh, the model to be, the wages to be totally non-cyclical because, in fact, we observe that wages are a little bit cyclical in the data. So the bargaining does have in it things that will make the wage a little bit pro-cyclical. For example, if bargaining were to continue, then you have, you, you're not producing, and so you're losing that output. The worker's losing a wage, and in a boom, uh, that might be a lot more that they're losing. Uh, than in a recession when there's when there's less output going on. Um, the other thing is uh, that connects the bargaining to the outside world is delta, uh, which is the probability that that negotiation if you reject the negotiations could break down completely. You're thinking about the outside world uh, because of that, and therefore you're making the wage a little bit sensitive to the outside world. So. The things like this gamma make the, insulate the wage from the outside world, but you don't want that 100% because then the wages wouldn't be cyclical, and that that would doesn't uh, that isn't what uh, what happens. So the way it works in the model is that after an expansionary shock, wages rise, so they are procyclically cyclical, but by only a small amount. That's the point. Okay. The, uh, I, I spent a lot of time describing the alternating offer bargaining, but you can actually solve for the real wage uh, analytically. It's very straightforward. And uh, the solution is given by this equation that doesn't at first sight look like an equation for the real wage. But if you recall, the J has, has W in it and the V has W in it. You can see that this is an equation that's, that the, you can think of this as an equation that determines W as a function of things that are exogenous to the bargaining pair. The value of what the worker produces, the unemployment benefits, the cost of renegotiation, and you, the, the utility of being um, um, unemployed. So this is actually a wage determination uh, thing. It can be compared with uh, the so-called Nash sharing rule, which most of you I'm sure are familiar with, which is the Nash sharing rule says takes defines the total surplus of a match as what the firm gets plus what the, the net amount that the worker gets, V minus U, that's the total surplus, and it posits that the wage is set so that the worker gets eta of that. This is also a wage setting rule because you can see there's a wage hiding inside here, so you can think of this as a wage setting rule. This we Our alternating offer bargaining model delivers a sh kind of a thing that looks like a sharing rule like the Nash sharing rule, although it has things in it that are not a function of time and help make the wage not so much a function of uh, cyclical, cyclical variables. The astounding thing about the alternating offer bargaining is how simple it is from a technical point of view. Uh, all you have to do is type in the, 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 the uh, alternating offer bargaining is completely summarized. The effects of it is completely summarized by this, by this sharing rule in the same way that uh, when you do Nash sharing, the effects of Nash sharing is completely summarized by this equation. So it's mechanically, like in Dynair, it's completely trivial to enter this thing, uh, this alternating offer bargaining. Uh, it's one of the big virtues of this whole approach because when you look, I, for those of you familiar with the implementation of sticky wage wages, uh, that that is really uh, m relatively much, much, much more complicated. Okay, um, the I'm going to uh, um, well, I'll just briefly uh, describe this. Uh, one of the things that's fun about this model is that it makes contact with another way of thinking about how wages are set. Uh, in particular, in this model, another wage arrangement rather than this Markov thing would be that firms and workers would bargain only one time when they first meet. That's another way of doing this. So when they get together, they bargain just when they first meet, and they never bargain again, even if they continue to be matched. And what they bargain over is the present discounted value of the wage. They don't bargain over the wage at any date. They bargain over the present discounted value. That's like a number, like eight. And then what they do is uh, they unwrap the wage from the present discounted value and pay out. But the workers and the firms, they only care about the present discounted value of the wage. If you stare at those value functions that I wrote down before, it's really only the present discounted value of the wage they care about, not the wage per se in any one period. So thinking about them as negotiating over the wage package, 
much like I guess what we do in actual in actual jobs, people negotiate about the benefits, about the time slope of the wage, and all this other stuff. Um, you've got that in this in this uh, model too. Uh, so, in particular, this model under the alternative bargaining alternating offer sorry on, under the alternative bargaining arrangements, the time pattern of the wage becomes uh, arbitrary, and um, uh, and it actually is in a matter of indifference to to to, uh, to everybody because everybody computes the present discounted value of the wage in the same way. They have the same interest rate. If some people were subject to financial restrictions that other people were not, then then the story would change. But in this model, uh, everybody discounts in the same way, so uh, they only care about the present discounted value of the wage. Um, and the interesting thing is that when you go to this alternative bargaining arrangement. The equilibrium level of consumption, investment, inflation, unemployment, blah blah blah, everything is uh, remains unaffected. So the model is is the same whether you do period by period bargaining, this Markov thing that I was talking about, or um, this alternative uh, this alternative approach. This is very much consistent with Barrow's some of Barrow's classic observations about the allocative nature of uh, of wages. Um, one way to interpret the thing that we do, that we actually do, is that we are in effect assuming that there is absolutely no commitment on the part of either the worker or the firm as to the wage in the next period. That's why they take the wage uh, in the next period as uh, given. Um, another another uh, alternative extreme would be the assumption of complete commitment, in which case they would just negotiate over the present discounted value of the wage and then allow a secretary or somebody to just calculate what state and date contingent wage payments should be made. Um, uh, that would be uh, another way of going. Uh, this, alter this alternative extreme, which is what the alternative arrangement is about, uh, is probably also extreme uh, and uh, we don't take that one. Instead we take the one, the Markov approach, and an implication of this is that the model has a unique prediction our model has a unique prediction for the real wage because of the approach we take to bargaining. Um, okay, let's see. The intuition for why the unemployment benefits lower, now I didn't see that, uh, so let's go back. Um, ah, this thing here, why D is in the neg um, why D is a negative, why the D, the answer is no, I can't give you the intuition about this. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to, um, why the minus D, oh no, I don't want to interpret this D as lowering J. So J is determined by, um, I want to think of J, J is, de, this is J, oh no, J, J is this expression here. For a given W, this is this is the value of the J is the value of the worker to the firm. So the firm doesn't directly care about uh, any anything other than what's in here. They only care about the wage and var theta. Now, uh, in, in in an indirect way, they do care about the wage because uh, if this is a smart guy, then they know that the outcome of the bargaining, uh, the W will be will be determined in part by the D. So the D is sneaking. You know, you could say the work, the firm cares about D because it knows that when it's going to bargain with a worker, if D is really high, uh, the worker is going to get a big W and the, and the firm doesn't like a big W. The alternating offer bargaining will produce a higher W as a solution if D is higher. Uh, but in terms of how D affects uh, J, I would prefer to use this equation here because this really is the definition of, uh, of J. But I guess in answer to your question, which I hadn't thought about before, this D enters in a negative way on J, I guess, because uh, it raises the wage through the bargaining process. Um, okay. Wait, alternative. Okay. All right. So this is, this sort of concludes the uh, discussion about the bargaining here. And 
And uh, what I want you to keep in mind is what's on this, uh, on this page here, which is that the, the, the idea about the alternating offer bargaining is that because what it's doing is as long as inside the bargaining uh, framework, uh, there are things that aren't too sensitive to the outside world, then the outcome of the bargaining framework will be a wage which is also a little bit less sensitive to the outside world. Don't want the wage to be totally insensitive to the outside world because we observe in the data that when the economy gets really strong, the wage goes up and so on. But we're trying to make the wages a little bit less sensitive to the outside world. And as we'll see, uh, reasonably modest values of gamma will have uh, will have the effect that we can uh, we can explain um, we can explain why uh, wages seem to rise relatively little in a boom and employment rises a lot. Um, so the other uh, okay wait the other is the one that determines the equilibrium. I'm sorry, our belt. Our, can you say it in a different way? I don't understand that. The, the one that has the J as a function of the B, that's, that one is the wish yeah, so, determination. So, see, so I want to think about this equation here. So imagine substituting out for J in terms of the present value of R theta minus uh, W. So imagine when you, when you see the J, I, I think the economics are better to think about when you look at this J here, you should visualize um, you vi visualize this equation, and uh, and 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 then when you look at d uh, v in here, you should vi when you look at v in that sharing rule, you should visualize this equation. These are all exogenous variables in the time t bargaining, so we want to visualize v is equal to w plus this stuff. And it, if we can go back to the sharing rule now, which is what we're talking about. Um, so I look at the sharing rule and I want to think about this J is, uh, is really var theta minus W plus future stuff. And w, V is W plus future stuff. U has nothing to do with W. And there's no other W's in here. So I want to think about this as an equation that determines W. And then then, so the economics are that this is an equation that determines W, and then and then uh, once W is determined, then we know what J is from the other expression. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Yes. That, that was my question. If this one was the one that is going to give us the the wage rate in equilibrium. If this one was what? I'm, I'm that is going to give this us the is wage, the wage rate. determination. Yeah, the, if we if we go back to these all these value functions, these earlier value functions, there's one variable in there that's not been that we've been talking about, but that has not been determined. We're kind of short one equation in a sense. So there's this W. So we have this equation. We have this equation. These are known. These are exogenous things here. We have these equations. There's a W, uh, and then we have U. That's totally exogenous. This there's no W in there. So we're kind of missing an equation because W is, in fact, a, um, an endogenous variable. We're missing, we're missing an equation. And the equation that pins down W is precisely this, um, this equation here. And where this equation comes from is we look at the bargaining problem that I talked about, the alternating offer bargaining. And uh, I kind of verbally went through it, but if you then set it up, you know, mathematically as, as it is, and then you solve for W, uh, the W that you solve for in the bargaining problem is the W that solves this equation here. But we, we must understand this J as being that recursive representation with a current W and the, and the V also. Um, okay. Yeah, this is kind of the missing equation. It's similarly with bargaining. This is the this is the equation that bin, that pins down uh, what the wage rate is, and then the equation that defines v is that recursive uh, equation. I think that's the right economics. That's the way I understand it, anyway, from an economic point of view. Um, okay, 
So we got the alternating offer bargaining, and that helps insulate the wage from the outside world a little bit. Now let me fill out the rest of the uh, economy. So the rest is pretty straightforward. We have a homogeneous final output good. Uh, it's uh, produced using um, lots of differentiated intermediate goods, the YJs, in the usual way. Uh, this is done because we want the monopoly. We want monopoly power in here to get sticky prices. We do have sticky prices in the model. Not it, we just don't have sticky wages, but we have sticky what prices? Calvo sticky prices. And to have sticky prices, you have somebody. You need to have somebody who sets prices. And to have somebody who nets, sets prices needs some monopoly power. Uh, but we don't want just one monopolist. We want like a lots of little baby monopolists all over the place. And this Dixit Stiglitz. Uh, production function is the thing that allows us to to get that. So um, this uh, this is the final GDP output <clears throat> that can be converted into consumption goods or investment goods. Um, it's converted into investment goods uh, using this with this technology shock uh, upsilon. Uh, this is a unit root technology shock. Uh, this is the first shock that you see in the model. Uh, there will be three shocks. Uh, this is the first. It's a for, it's an investment specific technology uh, shock with a unit with a unit root in it. Then the, this YJ is produced by people we call retailers, um, and um, they have a, this Cobb Douglas production function with a constant term to make sure they don't get crazy profits in uh, steady state. Uh, they produce output using uh, capital. And using HJ, and HJ is a is, well, that's the shmu that's produced in the labor market. They go and, they go to the labor market and put in shmu in here, and this is capital. And then they have a technology shock too. That's ZT. This is also a unit root process, and it's completely <coughs> independent of the upsilon. Oops, it, this thing has two unit roots in it, two independent, non-cointegrated uh, unit root uh, processes. Um, so this is uh, HJ is a, a quantity of a good that's purchased by the Jth retailer. The rate retailer is just as in the standard model. The retailer is competitive in the market for HJ, and the retailer is a monopolist in the market for for Y for YJ. And this var theta, or the price at which they buy HJ, the dollar price, is uh, PTH, the price of H. And uh, that, by definition, is equal to var theta times PT. Remember, I said that var theta is the real value of the of the shmu, and so the nominal value is uh, obtained by by uh, multiplying this thing by PT. So this is an equi this is an equilibrium uh, object here. It's experienced by the labor market as a techno as it's observationally equivalent from the point of view of the these guys in the labor market to a to a technology shock, but it's actually a price. Uh, we also have working capital in this model. Uh, the uh, retailers have to borrow to pay for this uh, shmu. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Then uh, the retailers have uh, this uh, Calvo sticky prices. They either have to have the old price, they stick to the old price, or they they get to choose a new price with these exogenous uh, probabilities. We don't have any indexation in here. Uh, people have severely Criticized indexation on, on micro grounds, so we don't have any of that stuff. Um, the uh, whole, wholesaler is uh, there's a wholesaler firm that produces the shmoo, and these wholesalers are the people we were talking about before. Although I didn't call I didn't call them wholesalers, so they hire workers in the labor market, and uh, and so on. So this is how the labor market kind of fits into, or the labor market discussion fits into the overall the overall model. Okay, then we have households. There are households in the economy. This is the place where all the workers come from. Uh, everybody enjoys consumption CT. The workers in the household are perfectly insured inside the household. They all consume CT. Um, this, I, in my view, is an economic shortcoming of the model. It has uh, uh, perfect insurance. And in reality, of course, we don't have perfect insurance for, for labor market experiences. Uh, there's a huge amount of progress going on in this uh, as we speak. I think five years from now we'll have uh, models with incomplete insurance markets. Um, actually, I have a paper like that. It's called un Involuntary Unemployment in a Business Cycle Model, very a baby version of a model with incomplete insurance. This is definitely the way to go, but it's computationally uh, wildly 
uh, complicated. And also it's got some interesting, uh, massively uh, complicated, but very interesting economic conceptual uh, issues that have to be addressed. But anyway, we have this representative household where all the workers are, are unemployed and employed workers are living. And uh, I guess I've whited out the, wait, maybe if I, yeah. So you can see they, they, they have the usual budget constraint. They buy investment goods, consumption goods. They, they uh, go to a bond market. Uh, <clears throat> the unemployed workers get D, real terms, and then multiply that by P to get their thing. The employed workers get a nominal wage W, that's the little W times capital P. Um, the worker, the firms, uh, sorry, the households build this capital and uh, using the usual kind of adjustment cost uh, mechanism. Monetary policy is given by uh, this uh, interest rate rule. There's, here's our third shock. It's a monetary policy shock that affects this rule. The rule is looking at inflation relative to a constant target. Um, there's a smoothing parameter. And here's GDP in the model, and this YT star is the stochastic trend in GDP. There are unit, as you know, there's unit roots in here, and this thing has, uh, uh, this thing has a well-defined uh, single, unique uh, stochastic trend, which is a function, it's a combination of the two unit, independent unit root shocks. It, and it's, we call it YT star. It's a stochastic, it's a, this is also a unit root thing, constructed from the two independent unit root things. Okay, so then, uh, all right, so now we're going to estimate the model. So the, the model, um, we have this model with three shocks. The model has impulse response responses to those three shocks. And then we're going to parameterize it uh, so that it matches what we estimate the responses to be to those same three shocks uh, in the data. So we're going to estimate the responses uh, using uh, a VAR. And then we use the restrictions that are true in the model on the VAR. So uh, the technology shocks are unit root, so they have certain long-run implications that we can use to identify uh, the, the technology shocks in the VAR. And then we also impose the so-called recursiveness assumption on the monetary policy shock. Um, when we identify the effects of monetary policy shocks in the VAR, those recursiveness assumptions are also imposed in the model. In particular, when there's a monetary policy shock, does not have a contemporaneous effect on inflation or or GDP. Um, so we're we're moving to estimation here. Uh, we have 11 variables in the model, the usual macro variables, but we want to have uh, all the labor market variables because we're really focused on labor markets here. So we got hours worked, unemployment, job finding rate, vacancies, uh, those variables also. Uh, then we estimate this model using a Bayesian uh, approach. Uh, one thing that's kind of fun about this is that um, we're doing impulse response matching estimation, which uh, has not always been thought of as something that was obvious how to do in a Bayesian way. Anyway, so we're applying a, a method that we've developed in an earlier paper about how to do impulse response matching using uh, Bayesian uh, methods. That's something that I'd be delighted to talk with anybody about. Very, I think, intuitive that whole thing, uh, but not part of my present, not part of the presentation. Okay, so then we estimate the model, and, and then we we look at. The, well, I'm not supposed to use the word estimate because we're doing Bayesian, but anyway, we do um, compute the the posterior distribution of the parameters, and at the posterior mode, prices change on average every four quarters. And this is when we're estimating the alternating offer bargaining model. So four quarter, I, that seems reasonable. Then delta is, says that the, delta, the estimated delta is that, that there's a 0.2% chance of a breakup after a rejection. Now we don't know what this, how this works in actual data. Uh, 0.2 strikes me as a small number and not obviously, um, not obviously you know, stupid. Uh, but it would be very interesting to somehow look at micro data to try to get a handle on this uh, on this on this parameter here. Gamma, the thing, uh, the cost of preparing a counter offer is one quarter of one day's worth of production. And again, I just I don't I don't know what the right value of that thing is, um, but at least it's not a very big number. You might have thought that because I put a lot of emphasis on gamma as the thing that's going to make wages not respond to the outside world very much. 
you know, might have you might have worried that I would have, that we would have needed a big value of gamma to get this thing to work, uh, but in fact. Most of the cost of getting a worker is the fixed cost in our estimation, 94%. So it's all that kappa, really only very little the vacancies. This is, I don't know of many studies of, that try to break down the cost of getting a worker between a, the vacancy part, which is the cyclically sensitive part, and the kappa part, which is not cyclically sensitive. Um, but uh, there's, there's um, the only paper I know about is Iran Yashiv's paper, I think in, in AER, that takes a micro data set in Israel, and he estimates a number roughly like 0.94%, that most of the costs of hiring workers, of getting a worker, uh, is uh, something that's not cyclically sensitive, is what his finding is. And that's consistent with our estimation. Uh, let's see, what is the data for those parameters from the NWU mar job market? Well. Of course, the the you know the the market for faculty you know is a pretty weird market, but you can be dead. So there, the the cost of preparing a counteroffer is very high. Uh, I know I see you're just joking, but it is a good example to think about and try to assess this. Uh, when when a chairman is is bargaining with uh, with a uh, a new hire. Uh, you know, they tend to be prima donnas. They say, oh, I'm too good for, I need better deal. So then the chairman is in, it typically involved in lots of negotiations with the dean to see if they can squeeze out a better offer. And these things involve uh, pretty big costs. They're, a lot of them are political costs and uh, they're, yeah. So, but, but the faculty thing is a, is a weird market. Uh, and the faculty market makes me think that this number one quarter is very small, but, but um, Okay, uh, so um, all right. Then the cost of hiring a new worker is seven percent of the wage. Uh, this would also be interesting to check out, but it's so hiring costs are not a chewing up all the resources in this economy, which is a good thing, I guess. Okay, there's another variable. This variable, people have spilled blood over this thing. This is the replacement ratio. And the replacement ratio that we're using in the mo that the model the, in the, the mode of the posterior of the parameters is uh, the replacement ratio is 0.37, and uh, that is a pretty reasonable number. Hall and Milgram uh, argue that it's somewhere between 0.1 and 0.4, and then Gerler, Sala, and Tregari they argue it's somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7. Um, uh, they're, they're kind of taking into account informal uh, sources of insurance. Uh, this number here is, is 0.37 is quite a reasonable uh, number, I think, in my view. Okay, so here's how well the model does. So now we're getting to the bottom line, which is can this model account for the volatility of things? So if you look at uh, this picture here, I've got the response of the economy to a monetary policy shock. I got to be careful about the time. I, um, Alberto, did I hear that you said an hour and a half, is that correct? I, I want to make sure so, I'm not going over. About 15 more minutes? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm watching, I've got my little, my clock here that's working. So, okay, so if we look at this thin line here, this is the estimates, the horizontal axis is quarters, and then the thin line is the response of GDP um, to a monetary policy shock, unemployment, inflation, so on. Um, using that VAR, and the gray area is a, a probability interval uh, for that, for that, a 95% probability interval for that response, or you could call it a count of, um, confidence interval, I, I guess. Not, not really, because it's symmetric, so this makes it look, because it's symmetric, it makes, it's, it's a Bayesian probability interval. If it were a confidence interval, it would be, it would be skewed. Um, Anyway, so, this, so the data are kind of this gray stuff. And then the model is, uh, is these little blue dots. And what you can see is the model kind of for the most part is inside the 95% confidence interval. It misses in some cases, like in the case of capacity utilization, which I really don't care at all about. Anyway, I probably shouldn't even report it, but 
Um, and it misses a little bit on the vacancies, but the cool thing is that the unemployment rate is, do, is varying by just the amount that uh, the, the data uh, seems to say it is. And it's doing so with parameters that seem not so implausible. And uh, it's a dramatic example of how this thing doesn't have the Shimer, doesn't have the Shimer puzzle problem. The intuition for how the model, the economics of how the model works is, in this case, it's got a monetary policy shock that drives the interest rate down. Because prices are a little bit uh, sticky, what happens is that the real interest rate goes down too. So people start spending more stuff. They start buying more consumption goods, more investment goods. You can see that uh, here and uh, here. And, uh, and then when they buy more consumption investment goods, then those retailers have to make more, they have to buy more schmoo in order to make the intermediate goods. So that drives up var theta, the value of what the labor market uh, produces. In effect, it acts like a monetary shock, looks like a technology shock to the labor market. Var theta goes up. Uh, and uh, the wages go up. You can see the wages are going up, but not going, they're not going up so high that they kill uh, the labor market uh, uh, responses, the hours and the, and, and the unemployment and the job finding and all this other, uh, this other stuff. So this, in some, so this is kind of, a, in, I guess, in some way, a big, uh, a big success, uh, I guess, for this model. Uh, this is the intuition. I just went through this. Uh, there's another kind of fun thing, which is the response to the neutral, neutral technology shock. So you can see, again, you have the impulse responses to the neutral technology shock, which is we estimate these, but, well, using the long run, standard long run restriction methodology, all the gray stuff is coming from the VARs. And then the blue lines, the corresponding numbers in the, uh, in the model. And you can see in all the cases, it's inside the confidence intervals. Now, the confidence intervals are, are fairly wide because long-run restrictions tend to be imprecise. So uh, there's a there's a power issue. But I want to draw your attention to one thing here, which is the inflation rate. And you can see that in contrast to the monetary policy shock, the biggest response of inflation in, to a technology shock occurs in the period of the shock. And what's kind of fun about this is that sticky wages are or inertial wages are essential. Uh, to this result. And of course, that's part of our theme, that in order to explain the data, you need to have inertial wages. So because that's part of the theme, I would like to spend, spend a minute explaining uh, a little bit better why, why is inertial wages critical to getting a big response, immediate response in inflation. And we can see that here if we go to the next uh, slide. So. So as I said, real wage inertia is crucial to explain the relatively sharp drop in inflation after a monetary positive technology shock. Um, now, why is that? Well, the way to see that is to remember something, which is that in this model, inflation is a function of real marginal cost. Uh, it's actually a function of current real marginal cost, future tomorrows, the day after, and so on. And real marginal cost is. Um, the numerator here, I've got the marginal cost in currency units. So this is the wage, nominal wage. And then in the denominator, I've got the price level. And why inflation is a function of the ratio of those two is very obvious. Because when if prices were perfectly flexible, the firms would want to set the price level equal to a fixed proportion, depending on the markup, of this marginal cost here. And so when this thing is very different from, say, 1, then uh, it means that prices are typically, you know, away from target. In particular, if this thing is a lot bigger than one, it means that marginal, the prices are too low and inflation will be high. Or if this thing is a lot lower than one, then prices are low, uh, sorry, then, sorry, if this thing is a lot low, this ratio is lower than one, it means the price level is high compared to marginal cost. And the firms who get to re-optimize their price, they're going to be bringing them down, and that's going to cause inflation to go down. So a, a crucial feature of sort of, actually, of models with price setting frictions is that inflation is a function of, of real marginal cost. Now, if we look at real marginal cost, as to write that out more explicitly, it's got the, it's the real wage divided by the marginal product of, uh, of labor, W over P, is the real cost of labor, and, and marginal product of labor is the real physical product of labor. So the ratio is real marginal, is real marginal 
uh, cost. And you can see in this expression here, oh, Alberto, is there a way to get that W to come back into view? Can you clear something? Yeah, there. So, Maybe it's working. Yeah, it's working now. So if you look at this real marginal cost, you got the real wage in the numerator and the marginal product of labor in the denominator. Imagine the real wage were fixed. So then when the marginal product of labor uh, goes up, as with the technology shock, then what happens is real marginal cost goes down. And, and uh, the model would predict a fall in inflation. Suppose now that wages were not very inertial. Well, then what you would expect is with a positive technology shock, you would expect a big jump in this real wage. And you get a big jump in a real wage when it's not inertial. But notice that if the real wage jumps a lot, then that interferes with the drop in real marginal cost. If you want real marginal cost to drop a lot with a jump in the marginal product of labor, you better have pretty inertial real wages. And um, so even for technology shocks, we need real wages to be inertial. That's a basic, uh, a basic result. And we have real wages being sufficiently inertial uh, to kind of explain the data. OK, now I'm not going to, the, the Nash model I'm not going to talk about. I just say this is our alternating offer bargaining model. That works really, that seems to work well. So now let me just talk, to spend the last few minutes just talking about unemployment benefits. So there's been a, I want to use this model to talk about uh, how unemployment benefits are going to affect things. So there's been a debate about how, what happens if you extend unemployment benefits in the Great Recession in the United States. And I want to think about the model's implications for that uh, debate. In doing this, I have to dif differentiate between two scenarios. One is normal times when the zero lower bound and the interest rate is not binding. And the other one is uh, ZLB times when the zero lower bound on the interest rate is binding. I'm going to do that. So let's first talk about normal times. Um, oh, Alberto, yeah. So um, the, when we think about a change in unemployment uh, benefits, I'm going to divide the impact on the economy by two, uh, in two ways. One is it has an effect via standard labor market effects. One is the standard labor market effects. And the other one is monetary policy effects. There are two effects. The standard labor market effects are the ones that are in the standard labor market literature, which excludes uh, financial uh, um, nominal frictions. And the monetary policy effects are in the DSG models, which have so the two mechanisms by which a change in D affects the economy. The sta standard labor market effects are very easy. You raise D, that makes the outside option of the um, workers uh, more attractive. And um, so it raises the value of unemployment. Uh, that improves their bargaining power. You get a rise in their re uh, real wages. And that will make, on average, firms post fewer vacancies. So you'll get higher unemployment and lower output. That's the standard labor market effect of a rise in D. Now, when we talk about the monetary policy effects in normal times, let's think about that. The increase in the wage that comes from the rise in D raises inflation for the reasons I gave a minute ago. And then if monetary policy follows the Taylor principle, when inflation goes up, the monetary authority raises the real interest rate. And that also causes output to go down and unemployment to go up. So in normal times, the monetary policy effects and the standard labor market effects go in the same, uh, the same direction. In particular, you can think of monetary policy magnifies the decline in economic activity that you get from the standard labor market uh, effects. This is in normal times. Now let's go to ZLB times. Well, in ZLB times, the standard labor market effects are the same, because those are the effects that occur uh, abstracting from nominal, uh, from nominal rigidities. Uh, but the monetary policy effects are completely different. When the interest rate is binding, then what happens is the increased wage costs raise inflation. And given that the interest rate is stuck at the zero lower bound, it causes the real interest rate to go down. But with a reduction in the real interest rate, now spending goes up. And monetary policy operates in the opposite direction from the standard labor market effects. So, so what we get in this case is that um, 
the uh, in, in the ZLB uh, extending increasing D will is predicted to have a much smaller uh, effect. And in fact, when we look at the data, uh, we argue that uh, in the ZLB in the recent times, uh, those two effects probably canceled each other out. Let me just show you the numbers here. So here uh, we have the impulse response of the model of unemployment in the model to um, uh, increase in D in normal times. And here we have the response of the model to uh, an increase in D in ZLB times. And you can see that in normal times, unemployment is definitely going up. And in ZLB times, unemployment is not going up by as much. Actually, you might argue it's not changing at all. Another example of how uh, nominal rigidities matter is that the degree of price flexibility matters. Um, so when prices are more flexible, then monetary policy effects are, are, are bigger. They're always bigger if prices are more flexible. When, in, for example, when inflation jumps uh, with a rise in D, the rise in D is going to make wages go up. But if flex prices are flexible, they'll go up by more. And uh, in that case, in normal times, uh, the unemployment rate will rise even more because the Taylor principle makes the interest rate go up even more. And in ZLB times, uh, the, the rise in the wage will make inflation go up even more. And because the interest rate's fixed, that means the real rate goes down even more. And the unemployment rate falls even more. In particular, the stuff that I showed you before the, here, this is for one setting of the price stickiness. Prices are stuck uh, for about a year here. Um, when I make uh, prices more flexible, you can see that the unemployment effects of an increase in D are even bigger than what the labor market people would uh, predict in normal times. And in ZLB times, the increase in D, if prices were quite flexible, could actually make the unemployment rate go down by, by a whole lot. So these effects that I talked about before with kind of normal price stickiness with less price stickiness, they get even more amplified. That is to say, the degree of price stickiness matters. So let me wrap up here. Um, so what we did was we built a model that kind of accounts for the economy's response to various uh, business cycle shocks. Uh, we're also working for the handbook chapter on a version of the model with a zillion shocks. And, and we expect to um, find that the in that environment too, we're going to get we're going to nail the volatility of unemployment and labor markets and 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 labor um, and finding rate and vacancy rates. We'll be able to nail it in the in the model with many shocks and I assume with also with uh, reasonable parameters like we have already done, like I just showed you now. The model captures what we claim is a key feature of the data: uh, real wage inertia. Uh, this allows us to get the weak response of inflation to a monetary shock and so maybe ironically the strong response of inflation to neutral uh, technology shocks. Maybe this is a little bit surprising. In fact, when we first, this strong response of inflation to neutral technology shocks is something that's widely documented and many people think that that reflects that, um, uh, that uh, sticky prices don't actually uh, work. Uh, but uh, we kind of argued that that's not that's obviously not true. Uh, sticky prices work just fine as long as you have real wage inertia, and you can get that from alternating offer bargaining. This inertial real wage that we get uh, uh, is coming because of the structure of bargaining, not because of any exogenous assumption. And then uh, finally, an advantage of the framework that we've uh, emphasized here, the search and matching, is that you can ask questions that you can't address, ask with other uh, labor market models, and, or sorry, with, with other models, let's just say other macro models, uh, because this thing has implications for unemployment. And that brings me to the end of this uh, presentation.